If you're sending a newsletter, obviously the thing you want is for your message to reach the people you're sending it to, to land in their inbox rather than their junk mail folder. In order to do that, you need to understand how mail servers decide who you are. If you send mass mail, you have what's called a spam rating. It's a reputation rating that assesses the sender, the domain, and the IP that a message comes from. Your sender reputation is based mostly on the messages you send and how the people who receive them behave. To avoid being flagged as a spammer, the first thing you need to know is, what does a mail server think a spammer looks like? So let's talk about the most common things that make a message look like spam. The first thing, of course, is the words that you use. There are words that appear more frequently in spam. There are reference lists of spammy words that you can check to make sure you're not using them in your mailings. Where do you find those tools? You can find them in the description for this video. I've included a link back to my website where you can download a resource document that includes all of these slides and links to all the tools I'm talking about in the course of this video. Once you've grabbed a copy of that, the very first section of the first page includes links out to some lists of suspicious subjects and content words. Once you have your text squared away, the next thing you want to do is take a look at your images. One thing that spammers do to get around that text check is they bury all their spammy text in one big picture. As a result, if you send me an email with one big picture and no text, boom, straight to the spam folder. This is a sale announcement from a legitimate sender, but it had one big picture and a button at the bottom. My mail server sent that straight to my junk folder, and I would never have seen it if I hadn't gone there looking for examples to show you today. If this sender had pulled some of their descriptions out of the image and included them as text, and got to that 80% text ratio, I might have got a new pair of shoes. The same is true for messages with too many links. Now you've seen spam messages that are nothing but a stream of suspicious looking links. Our mail server has seen it too. As a result, mine blocked this message from a software company whose product I do use. I've replaced their name, but look at this message. Nine lines of texts, and in it, four different hyperlinks. My mail server took one look at that message and decided I didn't need to see it. If you need to send lots of links, consider organizing those into one or two pages on your website and sending just one or two links in your actual message. When you do send links, send clear, brief, plain links. Really long links tend to look spammy and may get blocked. But using URL shorteners conceals where your link is going, and that's spammer behavior. Both of these practices will make your message more likely to end up in junk mail. Most of your recipients will check your message on a mobile device. If you're not using responsive, mobile-aware templates, your message will look spammy. You should also be aware that when you send messages with embedded forms, the Submit button is usually run by Java. Java code is also how many malicious actors dump malware onto your machine and is likely to get your message flagged as spam. If you must include an attachment rather than sending people back to your website for a download, remember that the most suspicious file formats are PDFs and ZIPs. These are the ones most commonly used or abused in malware and ransomware. Now, we've all received some spam messages that were so horribly written, we actually read them aloud to friends and laughed at them. Don't be that guy. Use your spell checker. Use your grammar checker. Make sure that the text of your message doesn't look like something the mail server wants to hold up to its friends and laugh about. Make sure that your subject line is related to your content. AI engines will scan your subject line to see whether it's totally unrelated to the content, and if it can't find a connection, it will status your message as spam. Stray formatting code will also get you dumped to my junk mail folder. Word processors, especially Word, are notorious for this. They save their files in XML formats which contain that kind of code, so when you copy from your word processor and paste into your email, you often get a lot of that code with it. Your best bet is either to compose in your email program or copy from your word processor into a non-formatted environment like Notepad and then copy the text from there into your email. Do your formatting in your email's native environment. This one I hope would be obvious, but we're going to say it out loud anyway. All that stuff that spammers do, all the weird little characters, the spelling out words with emojis, the strange spacing, the ransom note multicolor text, the 15,000 exclamation points, don't do what spammers do. Doing what spammers do 
makes the mail server treat you like a spammer. Now, once your content is cleaned up, you've also got to be aware of your message itself. If you send more than two newsletters a week, the mail server is going to start looking carefully at you to see if you're a spammer. And honestly, if you send more than one newsletter a week, your recipients are likely to do the same. Keep your message sizes small. One study showed pretty clearly that messages over 100K are seven times more likely to wind up in the junk mail. Make sure that you have a legitimate sender. You've seen what the spammers do. Don't do that. Make sure that the email address you're sending from looks like what it is. Newsletter at mydomain.com is great. Microsoft help at gmail.com is spam. Random strings of numbers and letters at mydomain.com is spam. Make sure you're using a legitimate, identifiable sender that a mail server can trust. And the same goes for your reply to. If you're using templates, make sure you check that reply to and that it matches your sender, or at least that it's a real address. A non-existent reply to will get you flagged as a spammer. We talked about keeping accidental formatting code out of your text, but your message too needs to have good, clean HTML. You want to set a max width between 600 and 800 pixels so it displays reasonably on a phone. Assume that your images will be blocked. Have alt text just like you would for a web page. Avoid scripting languages like Java. Use common cross-platform legible fonts like Arial, Verdana, or Georgia. And remember that most of your recipients are reading on mobile, so be mobile aware, especially with things like thumb-friendly buttons and optimized images to minimize download. And finally, the best thing you can do to make sure your message lands in someone's inbox is to be recognizable. Ask your subscribers to add your newsletter address to their contacts or to whitelist your domain so that their junk mail filter will know that you're friends. And because you're friends, you should be aware of your behaviors that will affect your reputation as well. First and foremost, changing providers. That means moving your website host, changing your domain, changing your mail marketing platform will temporarily reduce your reputation. It's nothing you've done. It's just the fact that spammers commonly buy a domain, send out a rush of spam, and then drop the domain. So anytime somebody starts a new domain or starts sending mail from a new place, the entire system sort of pauses for a moment and waits to see who they really are. If you do have to change platforms or providers and you have more than about 30,000 subscribers, stage your migration. Send your first messages out to a subset of just your most engaged subscribers. You want to send a smaller amount of mail and you want good results from that mail so that your new platform will be established with a good reputation. Once you've sent out your first couple of messages and your reputation begins to be established, you can migrate the rest of your recipients over in waves. That's your subscribers, the ones that you've earned, because one of the things you can do that will drive your reputation down the fastest is buying lists. There are some good marketing lists out there. There are also a lot of lists full of outdated email addresses that will do nothing but drive your scores down. We'll talk more about those effects and list management here shortly. The sudden spike in number of recipients alone will raise some questions, but there are also a lot of issues with list quality that will come back and hurt you. For the moment, understand that a few active engaged contacts strongly outweighs a mass number of disengaged or non-existent contacts. Bottom line, people you know will talk to you, and you should talk to them like you know them. The mail server recognizes generic messages differently than it recognizes messages that open with my name. If your mailing list includes my email address and my first name, leverage your mail merge capabilities to send me a personalized message. My mail server is more likely to think you know me and less likely to dump your message in the trash. Finally, understand the rules. Failure to comply with spam protection laws will get you flagged as a spammer. One of the most common reasons that newsletters end up in junk mail is because the sender has failed to comply with the requirement to include a physical address. Most servers will dump you automatically based on that one criterion. By now, we're all aware that we need a legitimate unsubscribe link at the bottom of a message, and I know you're conscientious about that. But did you know that if you add one at the top of your message, it will make your message look more trustworthy to a mail server? Let's circle back to that topic of list quality. You've been told over and over that engaged subscribers are better for you than a bunch of people who aren't listening. And that's really great kind of marketing sense advice that you're constantly balancing against that need to have more subscribers. We're not talking about that here. 
What we're talking about is how the engagement level of your subscribers affects your ability to get your newsletter into their mailbox in the first place. If I get your message and I don't open it, your spam score is negatively impacted. If I delete it without opening it, your spam score goes up. If I mark your message as spam, your spam score goes way up. From a mail server's perspective, a human being flagging your message as spam is the single most reliable measure of whether or not your message is spam. If I've completely forgotten I ever signed up for your newsletter, I'm not really motivated to take the extra couple of seconds to click through the unsubscribe. Marking you as spam makes sure I don't have to deal with you again. Realistically, how much does my one little click hurt you? One-tenth of one percent, that's one person in a thousand marking your message as spam, is considered the ideal maximum. If just five of those 1,000 people mark your message as spam, you may find yourself on a blacklist. This is why subscribers you've earned are more valuable to you than a subscriber you've bought. And I'm going to throw a word in here about two categories of subscribers who are most likely to mark you as spam. The first is automatic subscriptions. I bought my nephew a stuffed toy on your website. I really wasn't trying to start a lifelong relationship. When you start sending me your weekly newsletter, I'm going to mark it as spam. The other, and I know you're not going to like this one, is hostage signups. I told you earlier, you could go to my website and download a resource document. When you get there, you're not going to get a pop-up that requires you to sign up for my newsletter first. I'm going to put my newsletter sign up right there where you can see it, and I'm going to encourage it. But hostage signups are another huge source of spam markers. The marketing version is, you're drawing people to your website, and while they're there, you're getting them on your mailing list. The consumer version is, you lured me in with the promise of a download, maybe give you all of my information, and now you're spamming me. They're more likely to mark your message as spam. I know that's a tough one, and it's a really commonly recommended method for building your list. Only you can balance how that works for you, and one of the ways you're going to do that is by managing your lists very carefully. When you send messages, ideally they go to someone's inbox, sometimes they go to someone's spam folder, and sometimes they bounce. A bounce is a message that couldn't be delivered, and they come in two varieties. A soft bounce is temporary. You might get a message from your mail server that says, I couldn't deliver this message, but I'm going to keep trying. On the second or third soft bounce, you want to get that address off your list. Think of it like that old high school friend that you keep calling to try to hang out, and they just never seem to have time for you. At some point, you got to look at that and say, they don't want to hang out with you. Quit calling them. A hard bounce is when a message can't be delivered, most commonly because the address is invalid. If the address doesn't exist, you're going to get a hard bounce, a message that says this email can't be delivered. Remove that address from your list immediately. A hard bounce will hurt your reputation, but more importantly, sometimes mail providers take those no longer existent addresses and turn them into what are called spam traps, they basically set them out there and see who will keep emailing to them, and they report those folks as spammers without sending them a bounce message. Outdated addresses will always hurt your reputation. In terms of your spam reputation, that number of subscribers as holy grail thing will lead you astray. Let's take a look at that in practical terms. You've got 5,000 subscribers, and if you can get half of them to open your message, that's 2,500 people reading your newsletter. If you've got 50,000 subscribers, and you can get 5% of them to open, that's still 2,500 people. But look at the other half of this graph. We know that folks who don't open or who delete your message without opening it hurt your score. Those 5,000 subscribers gave you 2,500 no opens. Those 50,000 subscribers gave you 47,000 no opens. What do you think that does to your sender reputation? Job number one is to get your message into the inbox in the first place, and those 47,000 people will keep that from happening. I checked in with some mail marketing platforms to see what good numbers look like. Not one of them mentioned number of subscribers. This is what they said. Job number one is to get that message in the inbox, and you want at least 90% of them arriving. 95% is a good target, 
but 90% is a minimum goal. At 80%, you're looking spammy. Once you get that message in their inbox, you want to get at least one in four people to open it. And of those people, if you can get 10% of them to actually click the links and move through, you're doing okay. This is why purchased lists and forced opt-ins aren't always your friend. Manage your list conscientiously so that you can balance how those tools are serving you and make sure that you're getting what you need from them. And speaking of tools, let's have a look at how your infrastructure plays into that equation. If you're sending out newsletters, you probably have your own website domain. Use it. Mail sent from free mail services such as Gmail are much more likely to land in the spam folder. If you are sending from your own domain, there are three critical DNS entries that you need to be aware of. Most of you have encountered DNS sort of like the internet's phone book. Every server has an IP address, and in order to find it, instead of memorizing the IP, we type www.facebook.com, and your computer looks up that address in the DNS, the domain name service, the internet phone book, to find the right IP address. But DNS goes deeper and is much more complex than that. We're going to be dealing in that space, and it's okay if you don't completely understand everything and if you don't do this work yourself. The important thing is you need to know what you need, and you need to know what to ask for. First and foremost, your domain must, without exception, have an SPF entry. The sender policy framework is a way to tell mail servers what servers are allowed to send mail from your domain. If you don't have one, or if messages get sent that don't match that entry, they'll be rejected as spam. Domain Keys Identified Mail, or DKIM, is sort of an ID card that you can carry around to say, it's okay, it's me. If you're sending your newsletter from a mail marketing platform like MailChimp, the DKIM is a little ID that MailChimp waves around to say, no, really, I'm associated with that domain's SPF. It's okay. The absence of a DKIM, the presence of that third-party sender, is going to dump your mail into the spam folder. Finally, you want something called DMARC. Domain-based message authentication reporting and conformance is basically a way of preventing people from spoofing your domain and, when you're sending from something like MailChimp, of proving that you're not spoofing. These are complicated. It's okay not to understand more than that. The thing that you need to know is that those three things are how your server gets identified as legit. Find a networking geek, not a PC repair geek, not a programmer geek, somebody who plays with firewalls and routers. Hire that guy on Fiverr who's got a really good reputation. Call your best friends, kids, brothers, uncles, I don't care. The important thing here is that SPF, DKIM, and DMARC are how people know that your mail server is not a spammer. You need them set up, and you need them set up by somebody who knows how to do it and can do it correctly. An incorrect entry will hurt you just as much as an absent one. Get it done, get it done correctly by someone who knows how. Now, I mentioned third-party platforms, and if you're not using a mail marketing platform and you're sending a newsletter that goes to more than your 12 closest relatives, you need one. Whether you're using something big, MailChimp, Campaign Monitor, Constant Contact, a plugin like MailPoet on your WordPress website, you need a mail handler to handle your mail. Mail marketing platforms can do things for you that you either can't do yourself or that you can't do yourself without a ton of work. First of all, they handle that compliance element. That physical address, the unsub links, all of the things that you have to do by law, including laws you've never heard of. I've been referring to provisions of can spam, which is the U.S. law. Some of you may have heard of GDPR, which is the European law. If you're North American and you're aware of can spam, are you also aware of Castle? If you're sending to Canada, you'd better be. Or you can go to someone who does that for a living, let them handle all of that, and every time the laws change, they'll just update your templates and it'll be handled. This is far preferable to you trying to be an expert on the laws of every country where somebody may subscribe from. Your mail marketing platforms can also handle all the technical stuff. I talked about clean HTML code and responsive mail templates. If you don't know what those things are or how to achieve them, let a mail marketing platform achieve them for you. That's not a thing you have to learn in order to do what you do. Since they're designed for that work, platforms can give you a lot more insights on how your lists are performing. 
They can even automate many of your risk management tasks. Some of them will offer you settings for how many hard bounces or soft bounces before an address is automatically removed. These are great things to have taken care of for you. Many offer spam checking tools that will help you assess your messages before you send them so you can remove that one word you didn't realize was spammy or fix other issues before your newsletter goes out. When it goes out, it's going to go out from an IP address that's being curated. Mail marketing services manage the reputation of their IP addresses so you don't have to. Finally, they're going to give you lots of options for A-B testing. We're used to thinking of this in terms of marketing. Did the pink image sell better than the blue image? But this is also a great opportunity to identify where your spam reputation is coming from. Take a dip, not sure why? If you've got two lists that perform similarly, you can experiment with your content to see who gets the better delivery rate. If you think it might be this text or it might be that link and you're not sure, you can split those out. Send the text to one group, the link to the other, look at the performance, identify what's bringing down your reputation. And really, that's the most important thing, isn't it? To understand how to tell so you can fix it? Here are a few places you can start. Check your vocabulary. Compare it to suspicious subject lists, to lists of commonly spammy words. Make sure you're not using the words that flag a mail server. Check your messages. Run them through a spamminess engine. There are a few listed in the resources, and your mail marketing platform may have one, just to let you know whether this message looks like spam. And use the tools. The resource document includes a link that you can use to go see if your domain is on in one spam list, and if so, whose list, with some links and information about why and how to get off that list. It also includes links to tools provided by some of the major players, such as Google's Postmaster and Microsoft's equivalent. Those tools will provide insights on how to get messages through to these two major mail providers, and if you're getting through to them, you're more likely to get through to others. But more importantly, they give you tools that will give you insights into your spam reputation so that you can understand where you're taking hits and address those at the source. Once you've been identified as a spammer, it's a lot of work to repair your reputation and get off the blacklist. This is definitely one of those places where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I hope you'll take the information you've learned today, you'll download the resource document, and use all of that to make sure that your newsletter lands in my inbox and not in my spam folder. I'm Nixie, and this has been Nixie Knows. Thanks for spending time with me today. If you learned something useful, please click like so that YouTube will be more likely to show someone else that's something useful, too. If you know exactly who needs to see it, click share. Make sure they get a chance to come spend a few minutes with me, too.